This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Got a great episode today. Today's going to be a unique topic on REITs, real estate investment trust. I've got an expert in the field. He's an author. He's a thought leader. Knows more about REITs than anybody else we've had on the show and maybe anybody out there. So really excited to have him to get have him as a guest today. Please let me welcome Brad Thomas. Brad, thanks for coming on the show, man. Great to see you, Ferd. Uh, we look forward to it, man. I've, I've heard a lot about you, and uh, this is a great podcast. Thanks for letting me on. You got it. Well, I follow, like I said it before, I follow you on LinkedIn and you got a lot of good t- content. And you're the only guy I know who I think has a recommendation from Sam Zell in his book. So I'm pretty jealous about that. I don't have a book, but if I do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe ask you to read it and then maybe get Sam in there too. But uh, that's awesome. So tell us a little more about yourself, your background, and then we'll get into REITs and get into some manufactured housing REITs and stuff as well. Great. I'll just keep it really short. Uh, I've been in real estate now for about 35 years, right out of college. I uh, went to work as a leasing agent. Then I pivoted to become a developer, saw those developers making money. I wanted to uh, collect my own rent checks, did that for about 25 years, and then uh, also operated a couple franchises for Papa John's and Athlete's Foot. Then this thing came along called the Great Recession. If you ever heard of that, you know, it's the, it's the great one. And, uh, and I did a pivot. I did a complete pivot, and I went over to, uh, <clears throat> to become a writer, an analyst. Never really liked writing uh, and actually made C's in college in English, full disclosure, uh, I did write the rap review in high school. Um, that was the old school rap, of course, Bird. But, uh, but then I always love writing. I like communicating with people, just like we're communicating here. Uh, but And really helping individual investors with real estate decisions. I lost a lot of money in my past. A lot of that was due to, uh, you know, some uh, lack of liquidity when I needed it, uh, not, ha- not being diversified. And, uh, and really quality management. And, and, and that points all, all, all directions to REITs because REITs have liquidity, REITs are diversified, REITs have the transparency and publicly traded. So it was, it was a great pivot for me. I've been doing this now, this new job for about 11 years, and it's been a really exciting, uh, exciting business. So I love educating investors and helping them build their portfolios with publicly traded uh, REITs. Good stuff, Brad. Now, I'm, I'm familiar with REITs. I used to work with some guys that uh, had a publicly traded REIT and kind of entertainment business and, and some other real estate related entertainment. But you obviously look at a lot of different REITs. Can you just give us the Reader's Digest summary of what's a REIT? Because a lot of people are like, I want you to I diverse. I mean, I can invest in real estate. Well, that, that oftentimes is like it's a limited partner in a syndication. It's oftentimes is an active operator, which has its own pros and cons. But a REIT is clearly going to be a big operator, generally a professional operator, or a publicly traded company. How do people invest in REITs and, and what are the, the key distinctions between that compared to others, say dividend investing, stock investing, or active real estate investing. Sure. Well, you mentioned it. I, I just published a new book called The Intelligent REIT Investor Guide. I'm actually going out with a master class here in a couple of weeks, uh, yes. which will be part of that part of that book. Uh, but in that book, and, it, and I encourage everybody to read it because uh, we do cover all the details. But at a high level, there's one law that really differentiates REITs from any other um, type of uh, in, investable um, asset class, and that is that REITs are required to pay out 90% of their taxable income. This law was created in 1960, actually part of the Cigar Act and the Eisenhower administration. And what that did, that law, the really premise for that law was it gave individual investors, and I'll say that again, individual investors, not institutional investors, so this is average Joe and average Jane, gave them access to institutionally held commercial real estate. Now, when it started out in the very early days, there were just very limited there were just a few REITs. Actually, a large majority of these were mortgage REITs. They lent, lent they didn't own the property. Um, and then they evolved into more equity REITs, which they own the property. And of course, in the very early days, in the 70s and 80s, there were just, the REITs were just the primary food groups like retail and, and uh, you know, apartments. And now, these days, when you, when you kind of fast forward from 1960 now, six, over 60 years till today, is what's really amazing is the size, the depth, the diversification, the liquidity in the U.S. Uh, uh, REIT sector, even sectors that I never imagined, even when you know, 10 years ago, when I started writing, 
I never imagined that I would be covering cannabis in prisons and uh, cell towers and data centers. So we've seen all types of new uh, at real estate assets. The co- so the, again, part of that law is they, of course, have to be real estate. The, the companies have to own or lease real estate. I want to clear that up too, because you don't actually have to be a REIT to own the property. You can lease it. A number of these cell tower REITs, for example, they don't actually own the land. They, they own the easements or the dirt underneath it. They control that through a lease. Same thing for data centers. Uh, those, co- those data centers, don't. a lot of those companies like Equinix, they don't actually own the physical building, but they did get the IRS private letter ruling allowing the racking system to qualify because it is attached to the ground right. to qualify as real estate. So that's expanded that envelope. So it's, it's a very large, I, you know, I think about it like this, and I, I talk about it like this a lot, is that think about, you know, one day we'll probably have NFL, NFL or NBA stadiums or railroads. There's a number of things that could be readable. So it's, it's an ever expanding universe. And that's one thing I like about the business because it does give individual investors all types of options and alternatives to invest in real estate. No, good stuff. That was always an attraction of it. Like you could, you know, you can buy a share of Coca-Cola, right? You don't have to own Coca-Cola. You can buy a share of an NFL stadium or some data center as a REIT. Now, in, in general, because these are, there's a large regulatory environment, I know, and these are big scale projects, big scale companies. What kind, what is the, the range of yield or investment return? I mean, I think of REITs oftentimes is more because they pay out the cash. It's kind of like a dividend, but because there's real estate, there's some other benefits um, hopefully appreciation and NOI growth and things like that. How does how does that work for the, in an individual in, uh, investor like myself? And do any of the tax benefits from real estate come to me? Or is that all at the, more of the corporate level and they don't flow through? And what are some of the pros and cons of that? Yeah, great, great question. Well, again, uh, what really uh, drives this REIT sector today, and the, I'm talking for the retail investor, individual investor, is dividend yield. And again, so when you compare the REIT dividend to say the S&P 500 com- or S&P stocks are say traditional like dividend kings or dividend aristocrats that are not REITs, you know, those yields are, are somewhere, you know, sub, sub two, maybe one and a half percent, say on average, whereas the average yield across, you know, for all REITs is somewhere in the three and a half range. So really almost more than double the average dividend yield. And again, it's obvious what drives that higher yield is, again, going back to that law from 1960, the REITs must pay out 90% of their taxable income. So there's not a matter of, you know, will they, they have to, or they can't become a REIT. They have to, they have to pay out at least 90%, and most pay out, by the way, 100% of the taxable income. Now, one of the things we look for in our, in our research, of course, is we want investors to not only, you know, invest because of the yield, because a lot of investors, not just REIT investors, just stock stock investors in general, they always look to that yield first, but you've got to look to yield safety. How safe is that dividend? So we look at things to make sure that the company can cover its earnings, uh, which we have a little different metric in the REIT sector called FFO, funds from operations, which basically factors in the depreciation because REITs do have real estate. So um, when you add back that depreciation, you really come back with a you know more uh, a pure form of earnings, which is a better form of earnings. So I, I, I coach or tell investors all the time, you shouldn't compare, you know, REITs uh, on, a, on a price to earnings multiple. You should compare it on a price to funds from operation multiple. That's one big difference that we see all the time. But again, in terms of kind of that comparison, it's a lot of its yield. And we like to see dividend growth because companies that are able to grow that dividend, uh, generally they're going to outperform over time. And that, that goes the same for stocks as well. So we look at the higher quality companies. We, we cover about 150 equity REITs today. And again, all, all shapes and sizes, all different sectors, as well as the commercial mortgage REITs, not the residential, but we do cover the commercial mortgage REITs. A lot of these are private equity firms or private equity firm backed uh, businesses like Starwood, TPG, KKR, Blackstone, et cetera. And they have commercial mortgage REITs uh, that complement their private equity platforms. And again, these are lenders to different uh, asset class uh, property sectors. We even cover, can- there's a cannabis, a couple cannabis mortgage REITs now. There's a single family home builder, actually two single family home builder mortgage REITs. They provide construction lending for home builders or multifamily home uh, builders. So there's, again, there's a lot of capital out there today, but again, that's the primary, the dividend is really the biggest uh, attraction, you know, to the business. Now in terms of total returns, cause you asked, you know, kind of what drives that uh, generally, I mean, what we try to do, uh, and by the way, I purposely titled my book, The Intelligent REIT Investor, uh, really after 
the more famous book called The Intelligent Investor, which was, of course, written by Benjamin Graham, uh, Warren Buffett's uh, uh, mentor and, and, uh, and coach. Uh, and, um, and so we're value investors. We like to buy companies, not only REITs, but you know, stocks in general that are trading at a discount um, to their intrinsic value. And so the way we try to build portfolios or, or help investors build portfolios, we, buy, we look at the cheapest uh, companies, but we also look at the, the, we want to see quality first. Quality is really the most important. So analyzing the company's balance sheet, its liquidity, its earnings history, its dividend history, its current dividend payout ratio. We spend a lot of time interviewing management teams as well, make sure that uh, you know, they're playing uh, the right game and that, um, you know, that our interests are aligned with their interests. Uh, we like to see internally managed um, REITs, not to say external or bad, but you've got to be careful with conflicts of interest because there are some, quite a few that we see out there on those external, externally managed platforms. Um, and again, we evaluate the entire company. Uh, we like to build portfolios based on, you know, really the investor's risk profile because every, every, every investor is going to have his or her on types of profile and what they're looking for. Age obviously has a lot to do with it. The younger, the younger generation, like my son, for example, is an NFT investor, which uh, I found that hard to believe. But um, anyway, uh, that's, uh, that he's a, obviously a more speculative, uh, you know, I wouldn't even call investor. He's more speculative. I don't, I don't know. He's a gambler. Yeah, he's a gambler. Exactly. He is a gambler. Um, and by the way, he won seventy thousand dollars in two and during uh, two thousand twenty-one uh, playing video games online. Seventy thousand, and he got the money in uh, in crypto or blockchain, and uh, he's invested about half of that back into. Uh, not, I'm sorry, he didn't invest. He put the rest of it back into um, NFTs and all that, and he's got the other half in some blue chip companies that I've recommended. But uh, at any rate, uh, re re REITs are great and. You know, I uh, as a developer, I mean, I come at this with a different angle because I was a private developer for 25 years. So I can really attest to there. I mean, look, I'm not I'm doing private investing, too, just as you are and some of your in your clients. Uh, so private's fine. You know, there's that trade off we have with uh, volatility and liquidity. So if you want to be sure. private, obviously, you don't have that volatility that you don't have Mr. Market telling you what your shares are worth every day when you wake up. Um, but uh, you obviously don't have the liquidity in the private space as you do in the public. So that's the trade-off. You know, it really, I, I think the answer is, is probably a, having a good healthy combination of both private real estate and public real estate is a good answer. No, good, good stuff. I mean, you talk about diversification portfolios. Back when I was in grad school, I had my securities licenses and did stocks and bonds and stuff. So really, Went to the went to Warren Buffett's conference. You know, I had a B share. I didn't have. I couldn't afford the A share of Berkshire. But uh, familiar with Benjamin Graham and all that, all that stuff as well. Um, so good, to, good to put that all in the hopper. I think. I think when I think of REITs for manufactured housing, they're, they're, you're obviously a big player because there's a lot of regulatory cost and a lot of underwriting. That the benefit, some of the benefits you just mentioned, you know, liquidity being one, but also your team, your industry, these people in REITs are being underwritten and being and interviewed and such. I've got some money in some uh, limited partnerships, limited uh, LLCs as an LP. And sometimes I'm pretty underwhelmed with the level of reporting and transparency and certainly the lack of liquidity. It's like, oh, I want my money back. No, you can't do that, right? So there's downside. Now, obviously you're talking three and a half percent dividend overall yield a little higher, is obviously higher than that. That's not that enticing to a lot of people. Your son is not going to be that jazzed about investing in a REIT, even if it's Sam Zell's REIT, right? So you've got the big players, ELS, you've got Sun, UMH, uh, flagship is on the Toronto Real Estate Exchange. And so I know I've got some clients like maybe we'll one day be a REIT. Now, what, what would you say is the minimum kind of asset center management to make becoming a REIT possible and or worthwhile? Like you got a $30 million portfolio, not going to happen. You got a $100 million portfolio. Probably not. Is it, is, it a, is it a billion? Is it, um, you know, does it depend on what the asset class it is? I'm, I'm curious on that because I feel like, I feel like in manufactured housing, the, the REITs that we see have large portfolios of large parks, class A properties that buy and sell at low cap rates, not a lot of upside left in them. It's long term stability and cash flow. And relative to other asset classes, I'm biased, but I think they're going to be better. But you're, you're not going to make a, 25 IRR, you're not going to make a 15 IRR and you probably won't hit 10 um, is, is what I feel like. Do you, what are your thoughts on some of those topics? 
Yeah, for sure. So, and I get that question a lot. Um, you know, what size is a good size to go list? And it really comes down to the uh, to the management team. You know, mm-hmm. in, in the G and A cost, a lot of companies can't they can't internalize their management until they reach a certain size. Um, but obviously, the benefit to being external uh, or internally managed and having that size is being able to improve your cost of capital. So I think one of the one of the main advantages we see today in the public listed side is nobody can, it's, well, there's a few, but most companies, most private companies today cannot compete with the cost of capital that these public REITs have. It's just, it's not even close. Um, you know, and especially these companies that have investment grade ratings um, um, and so like the companies that we you know in the, in the manufactured housing space, of course, equity, lifestyle, ELS, and Sun, Sun Communities, both of those companies have extremely strong balance sheets and they have benefited from this, frankly, this surge uh, in, in capital flowing into the space. And this is like, you know, manufactured housing is like the safety zone right now, just given all of the, you know, COVID shift and people, you know, wanting to live outdoors, uh, you know, move to the South. And of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of communities now uh, in the, you know, in the sun, sun, sun states, really, you know, all across the country. And so all of that capital is really moving there to, to that. And of course, a lot, as you know, a lot of this, I'm sure you talk about this a lot, but a lot of the, the value of owning manufactured housing is, of course, you, you basically, it's a ground lease, kind of a ground, a super ground lease uh, uh, for a quarter of an acre. And it's, it's, it's a certainly, uh, uh, it's affordable. You've got to have, you know, housing is, is important. You have to have roof and shelter and you got to pay that, you got to pay that ground rent, you know? And so um, just that whole demand, supply and demand really is really driving the capital. So the equity cost, so we talk about the weighted average cost of capital, the equity cost and the debt cost for these, especially these larger cap companies, Equity Lifestyle's got a market cap of over 14 billion, and Sun Communities has a market cap of over 21 billion. Uh, now, a smaller one, of course, UMH is about 1.2 billion. All of those are internally managed. Now, when you get to these smaller companies, you know you've got um, you know you've got it's just harder to uh, to to kind of cover that G&A cost. A lot of these companies they may only have one employee, you know, and then they may have an external advisor um, that kind of oversees all the all the ancillary costs, legal costs, marketing costs, all that stuff to run the company. So it really depends. I think the magic number is about a billion, but I've seen quite a few companies successful at you know listing at say 400 million or 500 million. Um, and it, again, it depends on the, the complexity of the business model and net lease re, it'd be really simple. You could probably, you know, go out and list that one at a hundred million because there's, you know, you just collect rent checks. There's a, you don't have to deal with what I call the three T's the toilets, the trash, and the taxes. Um, and so that's why we like net lease, by the way. That's what really my preferred asset class. I was a net lease developer for 20 years, built, built for companies like Advance Auto, O'Reilly, Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, all that stuff. So that's a, that's a great business to be in, just collecting those rent checks. Or, you know, it's, uh, we call swan investing, sleep well at night. But I will say this manufactured housing, I've warmed up to it. I would love to own some myself on the private side. They're too expensive. I mean, you know, I, I just touched on the, you know, these, these names I just mentioned. I mean, the, the, the valuations for uh, equity lifestyle in some communities right now in 2021, of course, we had a huge recovery across all property sectors, but equity lifestyle generated 41% uh, returns in 21 and uh, UMH just absolutely crushed it. They did 91% uh, returns. Uh, just, you know, I know the, the uh, Landy family really well. And of course, Sam, who runs uh, UMH, but they just they just crushed it, and they've been able to really ex- improve their cost of capital uh, sure. tremendously, especially on the debt side. Same thing, Sun Communities up up about forty one percent. Now we've had a sell off this year, and we're still, although we've had the, for example, Equity Lifestyles down around ten percent. All the all the uh, those three listed companies in the U.S. are down about ten percent roughly, but still they're very expensive from a multiple perspective, from a dividend perspective. Uh, they're still pretty pricey today, but but back to your point. I know I drifted a little bit here, but you know, in terms of like listing, I think that's probably the appropriate size. But it really, it, it really, uh, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I think the main thing is if the company's externally managed, 
I was going to tell you these dividend yields real quick, but the, the uh, in terms of internal management, it really depends on to make sure that there's an alignment of interest with the with the shareholders, and there aren't conflicts, they aren't running competing businesses, and so forth. The dividend yields, by the way, for equity lifestyle right now is 1.9 percent sub two, Sun Community sub two, and UMH is three and a half percent. UMH has a little more leverage; uh, they don't have the quite cost of capital, but I really like what UMH has done. Um, with their with their expansion model, and uh, again, I think I think the Landys have done a great job with that. No, oh, that's yeah, that's good stuff, and I've, I've followed a lot of those guys as well. Met some of those folks, and what, when you talk about cost of capital, I mean, from an equity standpoint, but also you know, with, with a lot of with the publicly share, public shareholders, they can get people who the average Joe doesn't have the same opportunity in private placement part, uh, private placement randoms and things of that kind of nature, some of the private equity stuff. So they have a lower yield expectation, but then also they get a couple of that with the debt. I was talking with one of the REITs and they were saying, yeah, we just closed the loan, 30 year life insurance debt, 2% and change, 30 year fixed rate, 30 year ammo. It's just like, what? I can't get anything with a two handle now and not even a three handle and certainly not with a 30 year term. If I get 10 year, 12 year term with five years IO, I'm pretty jazzed. And these guys are like, no, no, it's 30. Like it's 30 only like, okay, well yeah. that's why. And I thought, cause I asked them, I said, how can you pay a four cap and make any money? And there's no upside. Like I can pay a zero. I told you about before this call, I had a deal. I paid a zero cap. There's negative NOI. Right. But, yeah. I, but I had 20% occupancy. So I had the opportunity to increase the asset value and turn it into a 15 cap. But if I'm buying a, the type of class A plus property, like these REITs are buying a lot of times, it's hard to improve, you know, and the, and the, and the, how, do you, how do you pay for cap? You're making, what's your yield? And the, and the answer is there, cost of capital, debt and equity. And then obviously long-term growth, operational efficiencies, if possible, things like that. Yeah. And again, I think it just, uh, what I like about this space is going back to that, you know, underlying ground lease, you know, we, there's a company we started covering for, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. They're, they're older than that, but we picked up coverage called uh, iStar and, and Safehold. So iStar is a commercial lender. They've been around a long time, but they, they started a division called Safehold, which is a ground lease company. And Jay Sugarman's the CEO. He's done a fabulous job with this business. He's really uh, you know, kind of the first mover advantage. Of course, everybody's known about ground leases for years and years, but sure. it's now becoming more of a, I would call it an institutional you know, asset class. And just buying that underlying ground lease, and uh, um, you know, we really like that that sector. But again, that's a new space that wasn't even covered available for public investors. And now you're seeing a lot of these equity REITs now, like Agree Realty, for example, yeah. where they're a, a net lease uh, landlord. They're buying ground leases now and allocating a lot of capital because that is the safest part of that whole capital stack. Obviously, uh, right. is having that, that land. Uh, but another one that just came up, I had to tell you about this. Uh, I was uh, at dinner. I've got an office down in Florida in West Palm Beach, and I was down last week having dinner with a, a friend of mine who is the former. His name is Gary. Uh, Gary was the former CEO of Cyrus One. They're an equity REIT that just was a mortgage a data center REIT, equity REIT that just was sold. Uh, and Gary was uh, he was telling me the story. He and his wife were, were going to go to Europe in 2020, and then COVID hit. They canceled their plans. And uh, in fact, Gary was on my podcast, uh, the Ground Up podcast. And so uh, Gary and I, Gary said, hey, I, I took a year off. I didn't go to Europe and I rented an RV with my wife. And, uh, and he said, I traveled across the country. And he said, I had this great idea about halfway through. He lives in Dallas, but he's got a place in Florida, I think out in the mountains too. And anyway, he was traveling across the country. And he said, you know what? I'd like to create a REIT that's just RV storage. And, uh, and he done, he's done just that. He just got a, a sizable round of capital from uh, Center, Center Square, I think Center Point, forget the name. Um, and, um, and now he's, he's putting his team back together uh, and he's going to be, you know, he's not listed yet. He's just got right now some, uh, you know, private equity money, but he's going to roll this out. And that there's another, a brand new sector that, uh, you know, property sector I never would, never thought about, uh, which I really would love. I cannot wait to have that, you know, pick up coverage on that company um, yeah. and try to invest in it today. It's, it's an amazing business. He's going to take technology to this. You know, as you know, there's so much uh, technology now, I'm sure even in your sector in terms of maybe collecting rent, uh, this whole, we actually cover prop tech now. It's really fascinating. All the innovation that we're seeing within technology. 
And if you think about it, actually, Extra Space was a prop tech company 10 years ago. We didn't call it that. But, you know, basically, we ripped up the yellow pages and we started utilizing the, these phones, you know, right. to, to, to uh, you know, to lease properties up and, um, and coordinate, you know, customer service things. So uh, Gary's going to take his, his uh, technology background uh, together with this, uh, this st uh, RV storage model. And he's going to scale this across the U.S., He's going to become kind of the Marriott of RV storage. So you, you pull in there with your storage and you've already got your, your app. You've already selected the beer that's going to be there for you. Um, whatever, whatever you got. I mean, you, that's, it's telling me it, it's fast. That's, that's ahead of, that's ahead of manufactured housing. I'll, I'll assure you that <laughs> we've got some, we've got some technology in our space, but I do think, you know, you know self storage is higher and you know, RV is higher with, you know, yeah. better, better marketing, better branding, dynamic pricing, you know, apps, all that stuff where you, you don't see that as much in the manufactured housing space, but, but, you know, we're, we're kind of our own niche asset. Um, I think we got a lot of the, the core fundamentals of real estate that are going to be superior than other asset classes. I mean, I'm pretty biased, but I think that's the case, but yeah, I mean, there's other asset classes too. I think that, that sounds like an exciting read. I just had a, for our, for, our, for our fund, we interviewed with a pension fund to you know, try to get their capital because they have a low cost of capital, right? And, and massive amounts of capital. And they interviewed, uh, I haven't heard back yet, so hopefully it goes well, but they interviewed about a half a dozen MHP guys. And then they, they told us once they're interviewing about 10 people, they said they're doing an RV, storage, marinas, which made some sense because Sun owns a bunch of marinas in addition to manufactured housing, and then helicopter leases. <laughs> which I never, even, I never even thought about that. Like, yeah, helicopter lease. I'm like, okay, maybe I should go do that next. But no, nah, yeah. that sounds like a high barrier to entry. But uh, yeah. so, yeah, it's, it, that's it's the new thing, right? I mean, I talked to a client of mine yesterday who he's launching a fund and manufactured housing. And he said he's got a you know bunch of wealthy contacts. And they're like, well, this one family office, like we get pitched a thousand multifamily funds a year. I don't like any of them. They're all the same. They're all, you know, they're all overpriced. Their assumptions are all blah, blah, blah. But he's like, Ooh, tell me more about these trailers. It's like, they're not trailers. They're manufactured housing, but he's like, whatever. Tell me more about this, the sticky tenant base. Tell me more about the supply demand gap. And the, you know, you know, someone tell me about the entitlement challenge and all these other things like, okay, I got your ear. So it's, that's part of it, right? Is find something different. You've been able to do that. Find you set yourself apart on the you know, analyst and author side as a thought leader in this, in a, in a you know, niche space. And that's what, you know, our industry tries, tries to do is you know, be, be different than 32 unit apartment complexes. Be different. Uh, than, you know, I, I totally retail. agree. And I think you've done a great job with this, by the way. I, I tell all of my kids, my oldest daughter, um, she works at CNBC. Her name's Lauren Thomas. So you Google her. She's, if you don't know her, because a lot of people know her when I mention her name. But anyway, she went, at, she went to business journalism school. I actually did the what I should have done uh, is, you know, go to business, you know, take, get a degree in business and journalism. I missed the journalism part, but um, she's at CNBC and she has a niche. She covers retail and um, you know, that's in her sector and she's become a, you know, expert in her sector and done a great job uh, there. So I think that's what I tell all my kids, just find your passion first. You know, that's, as you know, you're obviously passionate about what you do as I am as well. And then you find those niches, find those areas which you can really and become, you know, become the, the, the number one person in that, you know, in that sector. Um, speaking of niches, I was going to tell you one other thing that uh, was really fascinating. We covered the cannabis, you know, I mentioned the cannabis. And again, I never thought about cannabis. Um, there's been a lot of volatility around cannabis, uh, obviously, uh, is, uh, you know, it's, it's and, and the REITs have actually filled a huge void in the market because, the you know, the big banks, Bank of America and these federally charted these federal banks can't, um, you know, can't lend to the space. So there's some laws that have been discussed and tossed around and it's, it's highly political. Uh, actually, I interviewed yesterday a CEO of a private uh, uh, cannabis fund, and uh, he, he indicated he didn't think the Biden administration were going to see any changes. So it'll be a while. But, but this sector has been extremely volatile. But what's interesting for it, again, in terms of, you know, kind of the, the, the this cap rates and the comparison of, say, cannabis real estate to manufacture housing. It's the exact opposite. These cap rates are like, they start at 12% and they go to, they go as high to 20%. You know, it's, it's unbelievable, especially when you get into the greenhouses and some of those way out in the middle of nowhere locations. But, um, you know, it's really interesting to see. And so, you know, uh, companies like IIPR, which they were the first innovative industrial 
Uh, that was they were the first mover of the cannabis uh, sector. They've got we're forecasting and analysts are forecasting returns of about or growth of about 40 percent this year, 40 percent earnings growth, uh, which means the dividend is going to be you know probably 35 percent. Um, it's just incredible again to see. Um, we actually we actually own that one and a couple others uh, out there as well. But uh, you know it's it's definitely you know it's definitely a lot of a lot of uh, diversification uh, and opportunities. But again, back to your sector, manufactured housing is is really the way to go. You know, I would like to be on the private side again. I wish I would have bought ELS or or, or uh, SUI early on, or even UMH. We did own UMH uh, in the past, but it's just the, the the valuations just don't make any sense right now. So I think the you know the private money is probably the way to go, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think like, you find a good operator definitely from a yield perspective. Private's definitely the way to go. And as far as the cannabis, I think I'm. I'm pushing some business that way because uh, I just evicted three trailers full of uh, greenhouses. So, uh, wow. I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm sending more to the other business, but. Um, <laughs> well, anyway. we also, we also cover the prison sector too, by the way. Oh, good, good. I just, I just, I was in the field this morning. We got a park in central Illinois and the prison is like a mile away. And I was like, we need to get some of the guards as tenants. We need to get them to move in because they you know, good jobs and good stable employment base. And they, That'll keep if, if, if you know the guy next door works at the prison, you're probably not going to be selling drugs. So yeah. <laughs> the, in Illinois, the marijuana is legal. So it's like I can't tell. I can't really say no. Um, but in general, I prefer for it to not be in the property. <laughs> but, sure. um, well, this is great stuff. Brad. I really appreciate your perspective. Any other tips or uh, concepts before we go? And, and, if, and also let us know where we can find you. Sure. Well, uh, uh, first off, I would tell, you know, I remind all my subscribers and, and listeners, you know, REITs are, everybody should have REITs in their, in their portfolio, especially as you're in retirement or moving to retirement. Uh, this is a very, uh, very stable asset class, especially when you pick the companies that are going to increase their, their dividends and grow their dividends. Uh, our core portfolio has returned about 22% annually called the durable income portfolio. Uh, so we focus on those very st stable and predictable um, dividend stocks. We've got about 40 Companies in the portfolio, we've generated over 22% annual return since 2013. So that gives you an idea is how, uh, how that sector's really performed. Um, in terms of uh, allocation, we think that investors should have around 10 to maybe even 20%, possibly higher, depending on you know, the risk profile of the, of the investor. But we think certainly 10% is, uh, is, is the low end, 20% probably the high end, again, depending on investor. Um, and again, it offers reach offer this liquidity that the private space doesn't have and very predictable incomes and, and very stable and predictable total returns. Uh, now, where you can reach me is uh, I've got uh, really two websites. One is real simple, bradtom.com. My name is Brad Thomas. I just shorten it, T-O-M, bradtom.com. And then uh, Wide Moat Investors. Again, uh, Warren Buffett will tell you what a wide moat is. Uh, wide Moat Research is our company.com, widemoatresearch.com. And uh, again, I appreciate you letting me go on uh, for your show. I look forward to having you on mine as well. All right. Sounds good, Brad. I appreciate it. Take care. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.